And it was painful to me to reckon with this fact that all of that hard work and education didn't shield me from that threat and violence. But I saw so many of our young sisters in head bonnets, scarves, slippers, pajamas, blankets wrapped around them, and this is how they're showing up to the airport. Address how you want to be addressed. Okay, yes. cool. Perfect. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't agree with that. You don't? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Because you're supposed to be a, you, you're supposed to be addressed with respect regardless, period. Oh, so oh even no, it's not, no, it's not, nobody said no, not But no you saying, so just because somebody, dress how you want to be addressed. We talked about this on the phone. Mm -hmm. So if a, if, a, if a lady is on Instagram and she got all naked pictures, right? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to address her sexually because she got all naked pictures? Wholeheartedly. What the hell are you talking about? All too often do we as black people get caught up in this sort of intercommunal discourse that turns out to be extremely damaging and divisive to our community. Who sits in the front, your mom or your girlfriend? Do you split the bill or does a man pay for the bill on the first date? Now see, I'm a high value man. So what do you bring to the table other than sex? Would you date a man if he had no money? Like no money at all? These are conversations that don't really add anything to us as a community, but we know will sow division and drive traffic to whatever podcast, video series, or piece of entertainment media that somebody is trying to sell. Now these topics have been growing in recent years, but if there's one discourse that has persisted for decades, it's surrounding bonnets, do-rags, natural hair, professionalism, or more generally respectability politics as a whole. The bonnet discourse can be directly tied to a number of tangible issues within the black community, but the main one I wanna focus on is respectability politics. Respectability politics is the belief that if black people present themselves in a certain way or adhere to certain social norms, they will be respected in society and thus able to achieve success. And if a black person doesn't adhere to those social norms, or even worse, actively challenges those norms, they are doing a disservice not only to themselves, but are also reflecting poorly upon the black community as a whole. However, as is the case with all contemporary social norms, these norms are fundamentally rooted in white supremacy. And because of the fact that whiteness as a concept, as a structure is antithetical to blackness, those norms are inherently racist. What do I mean? Well, whiteness was created as an exclusionary system to classify a group of people as better or superior. While being inherently exclusionary, whiteness is also malleable, able to stretch and absorb other cultures and communities in order to maintain its plurality over other marginalized groups. This is to ensure that there will always be an underclass of people to be subjugated, and that has historically been black people. Whiteness could never include black people because it was created to oppress black people. Therefore, those norms are something that black people can never fully attain despite how much effort some may put into doing so. This operates as an extension to what I spoke about in one of my previous videos. In the commodification of the black identity, we dove into how white and non-black people gravitated towards our art, music, and culture in order to commodify it and profit. And we briefly spoke about members of our community who would quote, sell their soul in an effort to commodify their own identity. Fundamentally, respectability politics is in that same vein. Now it is important to note that respectability politics extends beyond just the bonnet discourse. We will talk about bonnets and also how respectability governs how black people are expected to act in every aspect of society outside of that as well. However, when covering the legacy of respectability politics, I would be remiss not to mention its inception. <clears throat> the concept was coined by Dr. Evelyn Higginbotham in her book titled Righteous Discontent, The Women's Movement in the Black Baptist Church. Here she provides a lot of added perspective into a group that is often excluded from the conversation of the civil rights movement. And in chapter seven, she writes about what she calls the politics of respectability. Now it's important to establish that respectability wasn't inherently a bad thing. It operated as a way for those black women to oppose the harmful institution of white supremacy by countering the preconceived racist imagery that was perpetuated by that system. It's the Michelle Obama quote of when they go low, we go high. When they go low, we go high. White people had a preconceived notion of black people, our culture, and our communities. So in order to not vindicate those notions, those Baptist women infused concepts such as equality, self-respect, professionalism, and American identity within their moral framework. And while I will speak to self-respect and professionalism later, I think that that is an understandable approach when dealing with the stereotypes themselves. Even now, we as black people often try to refrain from succumbing to the stereotypical, or dare I say, menstrual archetypes that are often placed upon us. hypersexualization that black men and women face, as well as the lack of sexual agency provided to black women, are things that have persisted in American society for centuries. 
it has evolved from American menstrual archetypes. So it's completely understandable that we as a community we want to separate ourselves from that type of characterization. However, as Dr. Higginbotham points out, the problem only arose when their discursive contestation was not directed solely at white Americans. They began to condemn what they perceived to be negative practices and attitudes among their own people. And there is one word that I want you to internalize as we continue throughout this video, and that is perception. These negative, these negative practices that were being condemned by those Baptist women were things that were only assigned that label. And make no mistake, this was prevalent throughout the entirety of the black community at the time with leaders of all genders. It just so happened that the term respectability politics itself was coined while writing about the impact that black women in the church had not only on civil rights, but feminism as well. This was behavior that was engaged in by all sects of our community, not singling out black women here, of course. Despite all of that, none of it makes this form of resistance inherently bad. I would go as far as to say that I recognize it to be a valid form of protest. But what Dr. Higginbotham wrote about and what we see in contemporary society is that this form of protest does not necessarily allow for coexistence with other forms of protest. And people who engage in respectability politics often do so while admonishing, chastising, or disparaging those other forms of protest. And that's where we get into the bonnet discussion. As I talked about before, bonnets are like the topic of discussion anytime we talk about the politics of respectability. Before I go any further, I want to reiterate that I'm not dunking on any of these people. Respectability is an understandable reaction to marginalization, one that I just so happen to disagree with. The most popular driver of this discourse was Monique's video from 2021. Now, if you don't know who Monique is, you are either not the target demographic for this video, or you are even younger than I am, which makes me feel very old. Monique is a stand-up comic and actress who is very popular within the black community. In 2021, she released a video on Instagram where she detailed an experience that she had in an airport. Here's the clip. Hey, my sweet babies. So, um, it took me a minute to say what I'm getting ready to say because I want to make sure I'm not saying it in judgment. And I want to make sure I'm saying it from a place of love y'all some of y'all have given me the title of auntie and i'm honored that y'all do that right but there are times where auntie gotta talk to her babies and say some real shit so yesterday i was in the airport in atlanta and as we begin to walk through the airport i saw so many actually too many to count and too many for me to tap but I saw so many of our young sisters in head bonnets, scarves, slippers, pajamas, blankets wrapped around them. And this is how they're showing up to the airport. I've been seeing it, not just at the airport. I've been seeing it at the store, at the mall. I've been seeing sisters showing up with these bonnets and head scarves and their slippers. And the question that I'm having to you, my sweet babies, when did we lose pride in representing ourselves? When did we step away of let me make sure I'm presentable when I leave my home? Let me make sure I'm representing the family I created so that if I'm out in the street, I look like I have pride in myself. And I'm not saying no full face of makeup. I'm not saying no full front lace frontal. I'm not saying none of that. All I'm saying is, could you please comb your hair? And if you don't want to comb your hair, they got enough shit out here now, baby, where you can style yourself up and look like you have pride. I'm not saying you don't have pride, but the representation that you're showing, someone would have to ask you to know that you had it. So my sweet babies, for the ones that do call me auntie, I love you for real. Even the ones that don't, I love y'all asses too. But the babies that say auntie to me, please listen to auntie. Always have pride in your representation of you. It's not to get a man. It's not, it is just your representation of you, my sweet babies. So I'm just giving y'all a warning. If I see you in the streets, in the airport, in the Walmart, 
and you got a bonnet on and you got slippers on and you looking like, what the fuck? Are Nikki going to tap you and say, hey, baby girl, show you what you worth. Show you what you deserve. So all of those posts that you see celebrities putting out there saying, hey, queen, hey, queen, hey, queen. Well, can we start putting it into action? So I'm asking our wiser sisters, when we see our little babies out there looking like they just don't care, and I'm not saying y'all don't, it looks like it. Can we just tap them and say, baby girl, you deserve more than what you're showing represent you with pride my babies and that may be a part of us helping our community because if you look like you don't give a damn how you gonna be treated and this part right here really encapsulates monique's entire argument present yourself a certain way then you should be expected to be treated as such this however puts the onus on black women to control the marginalization that they face this is the same rhetoric that is used to justify sexual harassment and assault we all know when it comes to the discussion of black people and the police, there's always this underlining tone of justification whenever they're pulled over, harassed, or even deleted off of the face of the earth, just based on the fact that they don't look respectable, they're not wearing the right clothing. Or whenever it comes to women being assaulted, it's always, oh, what was she wearing? Was she wearing a short dress? She was probably asking for it. Wow. Oh, you think you're fast. Oh, you think you're grown. Oh, you're wearing lipstick, crop tops, booty shorts, and you expect not to be treated a certain way, not to get that certain type of attention. Mm -hmm. So if a, if, a, if a lady is on Instagram and she got all naked pictures, right? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to address her sexually because she got all naked pictures? Wholeheartedly. No. <laughs> Nigga, what the fuck? I'm all I'm saying is, so you, but I'm a Okay, so let me ask you this. If you go to a relative's page and you see all houses, you're going to ask that nigga, do you sell cars? <laughs> It's a way to absolve the people who benefit from the system from their treatment of the marginalized. And it's actually the fault of the marginalized, the fault of the oppressed, that they're being subjugated in the first place. It's really important to realize that there's always a lack of focus on the people who perpetuate those harmful norms. And I think that stems from a feeling of powerlessness. It's hard to condemn whiteness as a structure that necessitates assimilation at the highest order because whiteness is so vast. It's easier to look towards your peers with condemnation, claiming that they are making us all look bad, instead of challenging the societal standards themselves. Submitting yourself to standards that you have no way of attaining in hopes that it spares you the rod of marginalization is a practice that originates back on the plantations. It's understandable, however, it itself will not liberate our people. And I want to quickly shout out Tina Noir as she has a great video talking about respectability, desirability, and the like. I highly recommend that you watch it. It'll be in the description down below. I believe that bonnets and do-rags are similar in many ways, but also different. While both are cultural signifiers for blackness, both have a strong association with black people, do-rags have an association with black men, and bonnets have an association with black women. This is fundamentally the same in the eyes of white supremacy, however. It operates as an object to attach ire to, something to demonize. But when we speak to bonnets, specifically how they relate to black women, we start to reach into what Tina Noir talks about in her video, the conversation on desirability. For a more in-depth look into that conversation, I want to direct you again to that video because she does a better job explaining it than I can. However, it's important to understand why cultural signifiers are policed in the way that they are. The answer is simple, white supremacy. White supremacy thrives by attaching cultural ties from marginalized communities to things that are easily demonized. For example, rap music. Rap music has a deep association with black culture, so we often see it used as a reason for why violence occurs in the black community. Even though that we know that the main driver behind crime is poverty, and there's no evidence that media consumption has any correlation with rising crime. However, it's very easy to scare white suburbanites in greater society into supporting mass policing endeavors when you convince them that we have morally failed by engaging with violent rap music. Bonnets are also only part of the story. They are the most visible part of the respectability politics conversation, but they are merely a symptom of a bigger problem, one surrounding professionalism. There's a great TED talk by Dr. Lakia Omagun where she talks about professionalism in this way. But it's not training that I'm talking about. It's not merely training. I'm talking about the values, the belief systems, and the structures that uphold professionalism that do not take into account multiple ways that people exist in the world. And that is because I think in the United States in particular, 
there are very westernized static notions of what it means to be competent, of what it means to be eligible, of what it means to show up as qualified. The definition of professionalism, according to Merriam-Webster, is the conduct, aims, or qualities that characterize or mark a profession or a professional person. But what does professional mean? Well, also according to Merriam-Webster, it means exhibiting a courteous, con conscientious, yeah, that's the word, that's the word, right? I know words, I, I can speak well. Exhibiting a courteous, conscientious, or generally business-like manner in the workplace. What this means is that professionalism isn't something that is easily defined by the dictionary, but by those who require professional people. The problem arises when the people who are deciding what professional means are overwhelmingly white. This is a phenomenon that Leah Goodrich writes about in her paper titled, Professionalism as a Racial Construct. Great paper, it'll be linked in the description as well. In it, she talks about how professionalism essentially acts as an arm of the institution of white supremacy, allowing and promoting certain sets of behaviors while demonizing and disparaging others. She cites an incident she experienced working as an attorney where her opposing counsel essentially belittled her before the judge. She notes that if she was the one acting in the way that her opposing counsel was, she would have been admonished as unprofessional and aggressive. And I believe that that's true. I would go as far as to say that if she would have even reacted to the racially charged tirade, it would have been deemed as unprofessional conduct. It's not uncommon to be met with vitriol and to be labeled as unprofessional or hostile when addressing instances of racism or microaggressions. As she writes, professionalism is a one-way street, especially when dealing with those whose conduct is based around the standards that are made for them. White people often have no problems meeting the standards that professionalism sets for them because professionalism is based around what is suitable for whiteness. Whether it be language, appearances, or cultural practices, if it falls outside of what whiteness allows, what it is comfortable with, then it is deemed unprofessional. White comfort is the express goal of white supremacy, especially when that comfort comes at the expense of marginalized groups. This is mirrored in the topic of black hair in the workplace. Texturism and hair discrimination is way too common to be coincidental, and it's something that is under-addressed by greater society. For example, in 2010, Chastity Jones accepted a job offer from Catastrophe Management Solutions. Ironic. However, one of the stipulations with that job was apparently that Chastity had to cut off her locks. The reason the hiring manager provided was that they tend to get messy. And when Chastity rightfully refused this outrageous request, the company rescinded their offer. The EEOC filed a suit on her behalf in 2013 and lost. This was appealed, but the case was dismissed by the appeals court. And this is one of many instances of things like this happening in the workplace. Hair is of great importance in the black community and is integral to the identity of many black people. However, it's more than that. The freedom of black hair is quite literally a protest against racial subjugation. Ever seen one of these before? They're more than just headscarves. They're powerful symbols in the fight against racial oppression. By 1763, when Spain successfully invaded the Louisiana colony, there was a large population of free black people living and thriving in Louisiana. The new Spanish colonial government sought to restrict free black people's lives and to impose a strict racial hierarchy. The Spanish proclaimed that all free black women must wear headscarves known as tignons. Tignons were traditionally worn by enslaved women while they worked. By requiring free black women to wear these head wraps, the Spanish sought to mark them as inferior to white women. The women had to comply, but they did so creatively. In silent rebellion, the women tied their tignons in ornate, eye-catching ways. Those who could afford to created tignons using expensive fabrics. Others adorned theirs with feathers and jewels. Meant to stifle their voices, instead, tignons became a form of expression and individuality for Louisiana's free black population, who reappropriated these symbols of inferiority and oppression and wore their tignons proudly. In 1801, Spanish colonial rule ended in Louisiana, but tignons lived on. This clip not only shows that freedom of natural hair is a civil rights issue, but it can also be attributed to the bondage slash durag discussion. Those cultural markers can be used as a protest against the politics of desirability, allowing black women to freely express themselves in a way that may not be deemed as professional or presentable. Beyond that, there are countless stories of young black kids having to cut their hair while existing in predominantly white spaces.
Tonight, for the first time, we're hearing from the superintendent who's taking heat for a dress code policy over a boy's long hair. He's defending the policy that requires a student cut his locks in order to walk at graduation. And the teenager at the center of the controversy also talking tonight, telling our Matt Doherty his civil rights are being violated. We have a morning exclusive. A high school softball player says she felt humiliated when she was forced to cut her braids in the middle of a game because her hair supposedly obscured the number on her jersey. This whether it's because of dress code policies or school sports policies, they all enforce a sort of set of standards over these students. And those standards often require the removal of any cultural markers that may intimidate or otherwise make the white populace uncomfortable. This encompasses the policing of language as well. well you assume they know how to speak to people correctly. See, there's an English, there's hood English, and then there's ghetto English. What up, yo? What's up, my son? What's up, fam? Well, some people don't want to be addressed like that, as opposed to saying, how are you doing today, sir? Can I help you? What's good? Nothing. Nothing at all is good. Because that's not how you address a person. The characterization of Ebonics turned African-American vernacular English as broken, unrefined, or unprofessional speech, as opposed to a dialect akin to that of Southern American English, is telling. The way we culturally speak is wrong or ghetto or unintelligent, which in turn classifies our culture as such. However, this is the goal because professionalism is predicated on your proximity to whiteness. It doesn't only encourage, but necessitates the removal of the black identity. And respectability supplements professionalism because what is deemed as professional must also be respectable. And even those who claim to care about our plight, allies who say they stand with us, will engage in this behavior as well. Enter the Democratic Party. Who? Ready. Ready. So I know what you may be thinking. What does the Democratic Party have to do with respectability politics? Why single them out? The Republicans are just as bad, even worse. Why don't you talk about them? The difference is the Republicans don't claim to care about the plight of black people. They are evil monsters for sure, but they have no qualms telling us that no matter how respectable we act, we ain't getting civil liberties. The Democrats, however, thrive off respectability politics. Respectability politics is a necessary part of the Democratic Party's strategy because it is instrumental in their operation as controlled opposition. It operates as a way for them to direct any criticisms of them or protests of the system as disrespectful or uncivil and thus not worth engaging with. And a perfect example of this happening in contemporary society is with the Black Lives Matter protests. While the Black Lives Matter movement was not started in 2020, that year operated as a catalyst for a new wave of protests. The high-profile murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery provoked the citizenry into action to protest racial violence. There was also unprecedented support from liberal circles as these instances were so cut and dry murder, with the added benefit of being filmed. However, before then, during the Obama however, before then, during the Obama presidency, we did not see this kind of support from the Democratic Party or liberal circles. In 2015, with the murder of Freddie Gray, who, in case you don't remember, because there were so many of them, he was a 25-year-old black man who was murdered in police custody, dying from his injuries to his cervical spinal cord from alleged, 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 unnecessary force. Side note, everybody got away scot-free for that one. Everybody got away scot-free. We're all good. No, no, no issues there. Followed by a series of protests and justifiable anger over the lack of care for a black man's life. And when the black president of the United States came out to make a statement, he spent 20 seconds thoughts and prayering Freddie Gray before immediately heel turning to talk about respectability. First, uh, obviously, our thoughts continue to be with the family of uh, Freddie Gray. Uh, understandably, they want answers. And uh, DOJ has uh, opened an investigation. It is working with local law enforcement to find out exactly what happened. And I think there should be full transparency and accountability. Second, uh, my thoughts are with the police officers who were injured uh, in last night's disturbances. Uh, it underscores that that's a tough job, uh, and we have to keep that in mind. Uh, and my hope is that, that they can uh, you know, heal and get back to work uh, as soon as possible. Point number three, there's no excuse for the kind of violence that we saw yesterday. It is counterproductive. Uh, when individuals get crowbars and start prying open doors to loot, uh, they're not protesting. 
They're not making a statement. They're stealing. When they burn down a building, they're committing arson. And they're destroying and undermining uh, businesses and opportunities in their own communities uh, that rob uh, jobs and opportunity from uh, people in that area. So uh, it is entirely appropriate that uh, the mayor of Baltimore, who I spoke to yesterday, and the governor, who I spoke to yesterday, uh, work to stop that kind of senseless uh, violence and destruction. That is not a protest. That is not a statement. It's people, a handful of people taking advantage of a situation for their own purposes, and uh, they need to be treated as criminals. When you spend more time condemning looters and rioters than the police department who caused this violence in the first place, you don't stand with us. You are not with us. And if you wanted to be with us, you would have called the mayor and called the police chief and demanded accountability, not asking for transparency, not turning it over to the DOJ. You would have made that call to the mayor and told them that these people are going to continue to riot in the street, they will continue to loot, and they will continue to protest until they get the justice they deserve. And I don't blame them for it. That's what you would have said. So when Obama comes out of here and calls BLM protesters and rioters thugs, that comes from a place of anti-blackness and white supremacy, despite him being black. But why does he focus on rioters anyway? You could take this whole speech and slap it on Tucker Carlson's nightly segment in 2023 and it will sound the exact same. The reason is, is in many ways, liberalism is fundamentally rooted in respectability. And it's not just Obama. Biden released a similar statement when he was a Democratic nominee in 2022. I want to make it absolutely clear, something very clear about all of this. Rioting is not protesting. Looting is not protesting. Setting fires is not protesting. None of this is protesting. It's lawlessness, plain and simple. And those who do it should be prosecuted. Violence will not bring change. It will only bring destruction. It's wrong in every way. It divides instead of unites. Destroys businesses, only hurts the working families that serve the community. It makes things worse across the board, not better. No, it's not what uh, Dr. King or John Lewis taught. I want to make it absolutely clear. Rioting is not protesting. Looting is not protesting. It's lawlessness, plain and simple. And those who do it, should be prosecuted. Fires are burning and we have a president who fans the flames. He can't stop the violence because for years he's fomented it. But his failure to call on his own supporters to stop acting as an armed militia in this country shows how weak he is. Violence will not bring change. It'll only bring destruction. All too often do Democrats conflate the justifiable anger of those protesting unjust state sanctioned murder with the hate-filled violence of conservative demonstrations. In this clip, he does the classic tactic of name-dropping Martin Luther King, claiming that it's not what he taught and violence doesn't cause change. Both statements which are categorically false. For liberals and conservatives, it's very easy to champion Martin for his belief that nonviolence is more effective than violent protests. However, where they fall short is the belief that Martin wouldn't have wanted violent protests. This belief stems from a misunderstanding or purposeful ignorance of Martin Luther King's words. King spoke about riots. He spoke about looters on multiple occasions. One of the most popular quotes started as violence is the language of the unheard. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. 
And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention. Large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. Here we clearly see Martin not condemning riots. We see him condemn people who condemn riots harder than they condemn the drivers behind them, the structural violence enacted on black communities. Now I can already hear you fingers typing. I hear it, I hear it. But what about this clip? What about that clip? I will never change uh, in my basic idea that nonviolence is the most potent weapon available to the Negro in his struggle for freedom and justice. I think for the Negro to turn to violence would be both impractical and immoral. There is an increasingly vocal minority who disagreed totally with your tactics, Dr. King. There's no doubt about that. I will agree that uh, there is a, a group in the Negro community advocating violence now. I happen to feel that this group represents a numerical minority. Surveys have revealed this. But the vast majority of Negroes still feel that the best way to deal with the dilemma that we face in this country is uh, through nonviolent resistance. And uh, I don't think this vocal group will be able uh, to make a real dent in the Negro community in terms of swaying 22 million Negroes to this particular point of view. And I contend that the cry of black power is at bottom a reaction to the reluctance of white power to make the kind of changes necessary to make justice a reality for the Negro. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. And what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the economic plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. How many summers like this one do you imagine that we can expect? Well, I would say this, we don't have long. The mood of the Negro community now is one of urgency, one of saying that we aren't going to wait, that we've got to have our freedom. We've waited too long. So that uh, I would say that every summer we are going to have this kind of vigorous protest. My hope is that it will be nonviolent. I would hope that we can avoid riots because riots are self-defeating and socially destructive. I would hope that we can avoid riots, but that we will be as militant and as determined next summer and through the winter. And that's true. He did say this. Conservative media loves to shuffle this clip in front of any conversation surrounding MLK and riots. But look at the date. Martin had come to realize that riots, even if he believed them to be wrong, were an inevitability with the lack of social change that had occurred. In a speech to the American Psychology Association in September of 1967, King had this to say. Buckle up because it is a long quote. Urban riots must be recognized as durable societal phenomenon. They may be deplorable, but they are there and should be understood. Urban riots are a special form of violence. They are not insurrections. The rioters are not seeking to seize territory or attain control of institutions. They are mainly intended to shock the white community. They are a distorted form of social protest. The looting, which is their principal feature, serves many functions. It enables the most enraged and deprived Negro to take hold of consumer goods with the ease the white man does using his purse. Often the Negro does not even want what he takes. He wants the experience of taking. But most of all, alienated from society and knowing that this society cherishes property over people, he is shocking it by abusing property rights. There are thus elements of emotional catharsis in the violent act. This may explain why most cities in which riots have occurred 
have not had a repetition, even though the causative conditions remain. It is also noteworthy that the amount of physical harm done to white people other than police is infinitesimal. And in Detroit, whites and Negroes looted in unity. A profound judgment of today's riots was expressed by Victor Hugo a century ago. He said, if a soul is left in the darkness, sins will be committed. The guilty one is not he who commits the sin, but he who causes the darkness. The policymakers of white society have caused the darkness they created discrimination, they structured slums. It is incontestable and deplorable that Negroes have committed crimes, but they are derivative crimes. They are born of greater crimes of the white society. When we ask Negroes to abide by the law, let us also demand that the white man abide by law in the ghettos. Day in and day out, he violates welfare laws to derive the poor of their meager allotments. He flagrantly violates building codes and regulations. His police make a mockery of law, and he violates laws on equal employment and education and the provisions for civic services. The slums are the handiwork of a vicious system of white society. Negroes live in them and do not make them any more than a prisoner makes a prison. Let us say boldly that if the violations of law by the white man in the slums over the years was calculated and compared with the law breaking of a few days of riots, the hardened criminal would be the white man. These are often difficult things to say, but I have come to see more and more that it is necessary to utter the truth in order to deal with the great problems that we face in our society. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that MLK was pro-violence instead of non-violent. Later in that speech, he speaks to his continued commitment to civil disobedience over militant action. However, he does understand the inevitability of violent actions despite his belief in the opposite. He also derives a distinction between rioters, looters, and insurrectionists, something that certain contemporaries fail to grasp. So we talked about how modern liberalism operates with respectability as its main driver for political action. And we spoke about how civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King are often used as a means to justify that respectability. That, however, does not mean that Martin didn't engage in with respectability. The dedication to nonviolence that Martin held brought him criticism from his peers at the time, revolutionary figures that pushed for a more active role in fighting against white supremacy, looked towards nonviolence as respectability. And I don't disagree with them. However, it is very easy for us in contemporary society to condemn Martin for his approach, but oftentimes does that condemnation borrow from the white supremacist doctrine? <laughs> Now, fundamentally, black people do not benefit from respectability politics. White people do. It operates as a way to shift the blame from those doing the oppressing onto the oppressed, as for why they're oppressed. The topic of black hair in the workplace and professionalism, which we talked about before, are rooted in making white people feel more comfortable with the presence of blackness. Tailoring the black experience to be more palatable towards a white audience and thus more socially acceptable. Fundamentally, it's a conversation about assimilation. The institution of white supremacy and its actors say that if you subscribe to the notion of white supremacy, if you do certain things, we will allow you to join this institution. And when a black person enters that white supremacist mindset, they will turn around and condemn black people in our community for doing things that are associated with blackness. They become agents of the white supremacist system and nothing better illustrates that than the historical revisionism surrounding Martin Luther King. Now, it's no surprise that the American education system is garbage. With Ron DeSantis in Florida blocking African-American history from being an AP course, textbooks in Texas refusing to acknowledge the history of slavery in every state which only offers a footnote to black history in the US history textbooks, it's an understatement to say that black history is undertaught in this country. With the rise of police violence and growing discontent within the black community, over racial relations, you will see more black people gravitating towards more revolutionary figures in black history, such as Malcolm X, Huey P. Newton, Fred Hampton, and the entirety of the Black Panther Party in general. Now, I firmly believe that this is a good thing. Within the American education system, these figures are either ignored entirely or outwardly demonized for their radical beliefs, like, you know, school lunch programs, things like that. More eyes on the lives of these figures, more people reading their works is a good thing and can lead to a shifting in the political stance of the black community as a whole. However, a newer phenomenon we see in the black community is a mischaracterization of Martin Luther King specifically. This is Hamilton. It will get me demonetized, but this is Hamilton. This is a Hamilton song. Yeah, this is Hamilton. It will get me demonetized. Yeah, this is Hamilton. So we can very easily chalk this up to a young person talking about something that they don't really fully understand. If not for the fact that 
This is a direct result of the white supremacist J. Edgar Hoover era FBI counterintelligence program. Ugh. COINTELPRO, standing for counterintelligence program, was an FBI counterintelligence operation which sought to disrupt efforts of what they deemed domestic threats. It operated as a way for the American government to infiltrate and destroy sects of our community fighting for equal rights. Doing so by engaging in clandestine and illegal, even though the law is decided by what the government does, so if they do it, they can just say it's not legal. Regardless, regardless. <coughs> immoral, we'll say, we'll say immoral. Yeah, doing so, engaging in clandestine and immoral endeavors to meet its end. This program stands as both a defense and criticism of King and his commitment to nonviolence. On one hand, we see people just beginning to expand their political ideology gravitate towards more revolutionary figures because of how liberals championed MLK's nonviolence as gospel. And on the other hand, we have liberals and conservatives doing that exact thing. Regardless of what you think of nonviolence, it doesn't change the fact that Martin did dedicate his life to this work. He was jailed and later assassinated because of his dedication to civil rights, and he was definitely not a coon. He wasn't. Characterizing him as such or as a bad father that some people do. What's more important, the fact that Martin Luther King is the man that fought for freedom or the fact that he was cheating on his wife? Jesus. I'm gonna give you this example. He's a great father. He's a great businessman. He's a great CEO. He's an entrepreneur. He's such a boss. He's a boss. Look at that man. He's a boss. Look he's, at a, him. he's a great father. Look at him, that strong black man. He's Look at him being at a Look his at kid's him. game. But you're cheating on your wife. You're not a good husband. But he's great in all these other aspects. How are you a great leader, a great CEO, a great black man? You're not you're not great. You're, not, you're, <laughs> you're a liar. not great. God, Jeez, you're not. Bitch. That is triggering. Yeah, for oh, sure. Well, I'm a good dad. You're not a good dad because you don't respect me. How the fuck you showing these kids you a good father and you don't respect their mother? You're not a great dad, my nigga. You're an okay human. Someone being a good person to you means they're a good person to you. <laughs> Someone being a good person to everyone means that they are a good person. Does the job of J. Edgar Hoover for them? Hi, yes, editing Sean here from the future. I totally forgot to mention that this is categorically not true. There's no evidence to say that MLK ever cheated on his wife. Um, however, there is evidence to say that the FBI did try to set him up to commit suicide. Um, going as far as to sending him a suicide note um, and a bunch of blackmail material saying that, hey, if you don't, if you don't do the thing, you know, who knows what's going to happen with this material. So keep that in mind. There's no evidence what these people are talking about is any way accurate of any sort. Uh, so yeah, back to the video. But what COINTELPRO also tells us is that it doesn't matter how respectable you are or how nonviolent you are. White supremacy wants you dead if you advocate for its eradication. King made it a point to stay nonviolent, to separate himself from the militants of the civil rights movement on numerous occasions. But that does not stop the FBI from labeling him as such. One of the stated goals of COINTELPRO was to prevent militant black nationalist groups and leaders from gaining respectability, including King, by discrediting them to three separate segments of the community. You must discredit those groups and individuals to first, the responsible Negro community. Second, they must be discredited to the white community, both the responsible community, and to liberals who have vestiges of sympathy for militant black nationalists simply because they're Negroes. Third, these groups must be discredited in the eyes of Negro radicals, the followers of the movement. This last area requires different tactics from the first two. Publicity about violent tendencies and radical statements merely enhances black nationalists to the last group. It adds respectability in a different way. What this means is that the FBI knew it could weaponize respectability against both the responsible Negro and the radical Negro. By classifying Martin as radical and violent, they could discredit him in the eyes of the respectable black and white communities. And by classifying him as a coon or spineless pacifist who doesn't really care about the black community, you could discredit him in the eyes of the radical Negro. We see this happen with all figures, revolutionary or otherwise, during this time. So we know this is just white supremacy repackaged as revolutionary sentiment. In conclusion, respectability is a complex topic that requires nuance to properly cover. Nuance I hope I adequately provided. And if I didn't, 
you will yell at me in the comments. That's what happened in my last video, at least. But overall, I believe that respectability can have a place as a valid form of protest as long as you allow other forms of protest as well. And for those of you who think that this video was very Martin centric and I didn't talk enough about the revolutionary figures, that's by design. I will be making another video about revolutionary figures, specifically the Black Panther Party soon ish. I don't know. I'm still in school. This video came out late anyway. Oh, then I have right here, apologize for a video coming out late. So, uh, I'm sorry this video came out late. It was supposed to come out during Black History Month, but I'm recording this on the last day of Black History Month. So there's no way this is coming out by Black History Month. I apologize. 6.25 mile run. Why do some people look so cute when they run? I mean, I've got my- Move, bitch, get out of my fucking what? It's Black History Month. What was that? Next thing. Mm, next thing. Uh, thank patrons. Oh, I have to look up who my patrons are so I can thank them. Thank you to Faye, Govia2000, Jack Lee, Mango Breezy, Obriga, uh, Alice C, Gut, and Kelly Jane. Thank you. I appreciate you all um, for sticking with me, even though there was no technically no February video. Uh, oh, I'm almost at 10,000 subscribers. So that's amazing. That's cool. Um, um, thank you, each and every one of you, if you stayed that long to watch this video. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a fantastic day. Um, but yeah, thank you, and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, no. Uh, so I just ended the video, but I'm back now. Because I, I forgot. I had a, a my my bonnet. It matches my my do rag and my shirt as well. And I was supposed to put it on for the bonnet section, but I forgot. So, yeah.